Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Village School. Uh, welcome to Village Church service here today. We're so glad you're joining us. Hello on Facebook. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going to sing some Christmas songs today and some worship songs. So I just invite you, first of all, to go on your smartphone to villagechurchburbank.org or on your computer at home and click on the slides, uh, the lyric slides, so you can sing along and worship with us. Otherwise, let's stand to our feet. Here we go. Let's sing some Christmas songs. In 
enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I You may be seated, everybody. Good morning, Village Church. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning to all you guys out there in uh, Facebook land as well. I um, want to welcome you guys here. We've gone from extended Southern California summer to a taste of winter. It's getting a little cool, so it feels good. Thanks for coming today. Closer, What's that? Your mic closer. Yes. Getting a little closer, and Christmas is upon us, so this is appropriate. Okay, um, so we have some announcements. Um, really not much going on today in Village Church. <laughs> some quiet evenings at home alone tonight. <laughs> right. Actually, you guys, uh, huge event. You're all aware of it. Jingle all the way. Uh, the, pre, the pre-show starts at 4.30 here on the football field. The concert starts at 5.00. 
Um, I was talking to Daniel this morning, and this is what Daniel said. In the midst of COVID, this is bringing joy and life in the midst of our pandemic, right? We have, he's touched lives, the Lord's touched lives through the choir, through the orchestra, and we're praying that tonight um, many lives will be touched both in person and also online. Go to uh, the website and uh, for Village Church Burbank and you will see a link that gets you uh, there. Also, you'll find that on Facebook and perhaps even on Instagram. So make sure that you attend. Uh, the, the tickets are sold out, so if you don't have a ticket, don't show up. But uh, it's all over the internet, so you have no excuse. Make sure you, make sure you catch that. 75 voice choir and a 60 piece orchestra. Who the heck pulls that off for a Christmas concert? Daniel. Daniel Jesus. Does. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Service is coming up. I think that's December 24th. Um, I'm sure of that actually, 4 p.m. And that's gonna be Facebook, one of my favorite services of the year. Um, there's not much else going on this week, it sounds like. Those two things, or as we're getting ready for Christmas. But you know, we have a lot of prayer requests. Um, there's a lot of people in our church that are being affected by COVID right now. Um, most of you know about Liz Carletta. Um, she is still battling COVID at St. Joe's. I believe she's been in there over two months. Uh, and so we just need to keep her and Dave and the family in prayer. Um, there is many people, Mark Beinford uh, has COVID maybe some others in his family. Uh, Kent Smith, who is uh, Cheryl's brother-in-law, also has COVID. Uh, Lorena's mother, and just a lot of other people in our church are suffering from this. And if you're not suffering from the infection itself or from the disease, you're certainly suffering from the consequences. And so we wanna make sure that, that we keep all of those in prayer. Um, Sandy, Sandra Boosie's family is still battling COVID and of course the loss of her. And so they're going through that process of mourning. And then Linda Taylor is, um, had surgery this last week and she's recovering. And so we're gonna make sure that uh, we keep her in our prayers. Uh, and then Lauren Crosby um, has, a, has had a double biopsy for cancer. There's a lot of questions they still need to answer on that. And so we're just gonna remember all of these in prayer uh, and just keep, keep that in mind, you guys, throughout the week. If we can uh, just hold them up in prayer, that would be terrific. So as we, before we go back into worship, let's just pray for all these needs, can we? Father, we're so grateful that in the midst of uncertainty and chaos that we know that you're the rock on which we can place our faith and our hope and even our joy. And so, Lord, as we as we are here today to celebrate and worship you and thank you for all the good things in our lives. Lord, we also think of those that have challenges and have needs. And so, Lord, um, you've told us to come to you and to lay our burdens upon you. And so, Lord, we're, we're giving you our burdens even now. Lord, we're praying for all these requests. Father, especially those that are dealing with health issues. Father, it says that by your stripes we're healed. And Lord, that's a promise you give us. And so, Lord, we're gonna stand on that promise. So, Lord, we're going to believe that you are going to touch all of these people, and that you'll make them whole. Lord, we, we love you and we thank you and for that opportunity to give you our needs, Lord Jesus. And we will continue to do that and we'll praise you and worship you for the answers that you give us and for the healing that comes, Lord. Father, we thank you for this. Father, we pray for this service today that we will be reinvigorated in the spirit today. And Father, whether, whether uh, we're here in person or on Facebook or anywhere else, Lord Jesus, that your spirit will just touch our hearts and touch our souls. And, and Lord, that we will know that it's been good to be in the house of the Lord today. Lord, we thank you uh, again for the blessings you've given us and ask you to be in our midst. In your name, amen. Let's continue to sing. Would you stand to your feet if you're here? And let's sing this song called Joy to the World. Ready, one, two, three, and... Joy to the world, let's sing it out. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature. 
nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. We will sing, sing, sing. Joy to the world. a new Christmas song to teach you today. It's called Hope Has a Name. Would you jump in and sing with us as you learn the song? First goes like this. Breaking through the silence with glory in the highest the hope of all creation resting in his mother's arms sing another verse a song on the horizon ringing through the heavens the long way to savior come to set the captives Come to set the captives free, come to set us free.
didn't see it coming The story of redemption Was started in a manger And ended in an empty grave If you need healing, here's where you find it. Lay down your burdens and breathe in forgiveness. If you need freedom, here's where you find it.
heart can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. worship songs come as you are is based on the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15 I don't know how many prodigal sons we have out there but I'm telling you I'm one and you don't have to do anything other than just come right and and that's the beauty of of God's grace in our lives is all we have to do is return and come and so as we um, think about that today, I'm just, my heart is full for what's going on in our church. There's so many things, uh, even in the midst of, of our circumstance that God is working. He's working in the leadership of our church. He's charting a path forward and I'm excited for that. We're gonna pray here in a minute um, for our tithes and offerings. But I also want to remind you that uh, this Sunday we can do our missionary giving. And so whether you're sending your gifts in or your offerings and tithes in online through the mail or in the basket, just make sure you remember our missionaries. That'd be great. Um, yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you that all we have to do is come. And Lord, we're never too far. And so Lord, we, we praise you for your grace that you've extended into our lives. And we just thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Father, today our, our hearts are full as we think about the Christmas season and we think about all that that means for us and the greatest gift that we've ever received, which is your, your son. Father, in, in the third verse of this song it talks about the joy in the morning and i can only imagine that the christmas morning for kids the joy they have for opening gifts but lord so much joy do we have because we actually received your son and so lord we're we're thankful for that we praise you for that father we want to bless the offering lord we pray that you would continue to use the funds that come in to the church for us to continue doing the ministry that you've called us to do Lord, we're, we're grateful for the faithfulness of our church congregation. Lord, let us not forget our missionaries at this time and let us bless them as well. Father, as we, as we look towards our message today, Lord, I just pray that you would put a special blessing on Wade as he delivers our message. Lord, that you would bless him. And Father, that again, you would keep your hands upon our church, upon our leadership and upon our body as we go through the remainder of COVID and also just looking at the path ahead that you have for us in ministry. Lord, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amazing grace. 
how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Sing with us. Twas grace. Twas grace that taught. If you would uh, turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Titus uh, this morning. We're going to be looking in the second chapter and the 11th and 12th verses. This is a series, Great Truths That God Has Taught Us From His Word Over the Last 30 Years. Somewhere in the uh, early 1990s, as uh, I began my ministry here at uh, Village, uh, there was a, a movement across the Christian world called the Grace Awakening. And the idea behind that is that uh, grace covers everything. And since we are saved by grace, it really doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how we live because grace is available all the time. And, and, and so it really doesn't matter. And so I, I just thought that was a little uh, risque in terms of uh, thinking about grace. And so 
We did a, a series on uh, the Grace Awakening. Some of you may uh, remember that, and it, it kind of culminated in this passage that I think summarizes uh, what we're trying to say about grace. Yes, we are saved by grace. There's nothing that we brought or earned because of our behavior, our actions, etc. Uh, as we believed in Christ's finished work by faith, his grace saved us. But that grace continues to work in a believer's life. And that's really what this uh, passage in Titus continues to, to say. So let me read uh, verse 11, and then we'll make some comments from chapter 2 um, of the book of Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. The grace of God. The idea of grace is that it's all about God. It's God's grace. It's of God. It's the grace that, that, um, uh, that is God's possession. It's not something that we own. It's not something that we create. It's not something that we do. It's God's grace, the grace of God. And this is the grace of God that brings salvation. There's nothing else that brings salvation to us uh, when we believe then it is God. It's God's activity towards us. And the word salvation <clears throat> is a key to the idea of grace. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them with a sense of almost perfection. He created them with a, 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 a sense of well-being where the world in which they lived provided for them everything that they needed. There was no work. There was um, uh, no suffering. There was no pain. There was no COVID. There was nothing like that. It was, it was everything just the way that God intended life to be lived. And then, as you know, sin came in and over the next several thousand years destroyed everything and put human beings at odds with God, at enmity between God and humanity um, uh, was, was, the, was the result. And so God sent his son Jesus. His grace has appeared that brings us back into this wholeness that God intended when he humanity. Everything that we were created to be, that, that's what salvation is. Where the image of God is now seen in us because of God's grace. Not because of us as human beings, but because we are now covered with the presence of God in our lives. And so now the image of God can be seen. That we were created to live in, as we read in Genesis, now once again through recreation, God's image can be seen in us, in his people, in the church. It's the result of salvation. Salvation produces in us that image of God that others can see. And God's grace is for everyone. It's for all people. It's the gospel uh, of God's grace. It's for everyone. That's why the message is proclaimed everywhere, because it's for everyone. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. When it says it has appeared, that's the word that means it was manifest. It, was, it happened in a moment. There was an event where the image of God could be seen. You could see the image of God. You could see the grace of God. In the 33 years of Jesus' life, his grace appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. As John, the gospel writer, in the very first chapter said, and the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace. When you looked at Jesus, when you study the gospels, you see God's grace. And so it has happened. This is an event, and this event takes place as we celebrate Christmas, all the way through the time when we celebrate Easter to the resurrection of Christ, from his coming into the world to his bringing us everlasting life through his resurrection. That was the event of God's grace appearing. It was a specific moment 
in time. In other words, grace is not something that we manufacture. It's not something that uh, we make up. It's not something that happens to us and we say, well, that was grace. Grace took place in that moment of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. That is what grace was. Grace is always connected to Jesus. You cannot disconnect the idea of grace from the person of Jesus Christ, from that event of his being here in the world. And so it says the grace of God has appeared in Christ. And when you think about that idea of grace, you see that it's completely God's initiative. Grace is God's activity towards us in Jesus Christ. It's from God and it's through Jesus. Grace is not something that we come up with. It's from God through Jesus. It's not something else. So many times people, something happens in their life and they say, well, that was just grace. Well, it might have been something that happened that was really good that they liked, etc. but it was not God's grace. God's grace happened in that event, in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ through him, not something else. It, and grace says that God is for us. The whole message of Christmas that we begin to think about now and for the next couple weeks as we move into our Christmas Eve service and then into Christmas Day. If you've been participating in Advent and some kind of uh, Advent uh, process in, in your family or individually, it's the story of, of grace. It says that God is for us. It's the incarnation that God is here with us, that God lives his life in us, that God wants to live his life through us, that God is for us, not against us. That's the idea of the incarnation. In the incarnation, we see the grace of God. So the story of Christmas is all about grace. It's God taking the initiative to be for us in Christ. So the message of God of the church is never about us. The message that we have to proclaim is not be like us and have a wonderful time and have a great life. That, that's not the message that we proclaim. The message that church is never about us, but rather it's about God's activity in Christ for us. The benefit of the Christian life is what God has done for us in Christ and through Christ now and forevermore. And it took place in that moment of time. The grace of God has appeared. It's a finished action. The grace of God has appeared. It's a one-time event that has ongoing implications. This is in the perfect tense. So as you continue reading in the next verse, uh, verse 12, it says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in this verse, we see the two moods of, Christmas, of grace. We, we see the indicative mood in, in which God is acting towards us in Christ. God's activity, what he did is the indicative mood. It tells the story. And then there's the response, there, the, there's the imperative mood, which is our response to God's initiative of grace in Christ. Now, our response, the, the, the work of God in grace says here that God's grace that has appeared is training us. It's working in our lives in, in a way to shape us, to mold us, to form us, into people that reflect his image. It's the idea that we see all through the Old Testament that, that, that God is the potter and we're the clay and that his presence in our lives is shaping and molding us into the people that he wants us to be. That's what God's grace is doing. It's shaping, it's molding, it's training us to, to be what God wants us to be. God's grace is not forcing us. It's not coercing us. It's not pressuring us in, in any way, shape, or form. 
some of the grace awakening back in the 90s was in response to legalistic tendencies that had happened in the church where the church says if you are going to be a recipient of God's grace if you are going to be a Christian then you have to act this way you have to act this way you have to do these things you have to wear these clothes you have to you have to follow this you know all of those kinds of do's and don'ts the the legalistic thing God's grace never puts a list or a burden on you or me it trains us, it says, it shapes us, it molds us so that our response flows from us as a, reg- as a result of God's work within us. And what does it train us or shape us or mold us to do? Well, the, the next part of the verse says that. It trains us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, to renounce. The idea behind renounce is the idea of saying no to this so that I can say yes to this. So there's certain things that God is training us to say no to and certain things that God is training us to say yes to. And as we discovered in our, in our last series last, uh, 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 last year, is that what God is doing is he's setting a direction in our lives. And so what we say as we respond to grace and as grace begins to train us and shape us, we say, we are going to move in this direction. We're not going to move in this direction. And, and so grace is a directional term. It sets the direction for the believer's life. Believers are moving this way. They're not moving this way. They've been trained to say no to this way and to say yes to, to, to this way. And, and it's not just a this way and a that way. The way that we're trained to, to move in is the way that says we're going to follow Jesus. Our, our lives are going to be conditioned by following Jesus. So the director of our lives is not the church. It's not a religious community. It's not a set of ethics. It's not a doctrine. It's not a book or something. What it is is it's the person of Jesus Christ who is leading each one of us as his grace is being worked down in our lives to move in the direction that he's leading us in. You get the idea? The the, the grace is shaping us to follow Jesus, to say, yes, that's what I want to do. In fact, it's a picture of Christian baptism. That's what we say when we're baptized, isn't it? We, We say that my old life where I was doing what I wanted to do is now over, dead, buried, under the water, and now I have a brand new life, and this life is going to be lived according to Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to be a slave of God. I'm going to move in that direction. No to this direction. Dead, buried. Yes to this direction. See, the grace of God is that which gives us a desire to live in a way that is following him. There's no pressure. There's no coercion. There's no sense that what kind of a Christian are you? There's never any of that that you find from the grace of God. The grace of God never condemns. The the grace of God never uh, beats people up. The grace of God never makes them feel inferior in one way or another. The grace of God is that which gives us the desire to live in a way that our lives reflect the image of God in us, in our relationships, and in all we're doing. We're saying, that's the way I want to live. Now, our performance is never up to our desire, but our desire is to move in that direction. And as we continue to live in a relationship with the Lord, His grace, He keeps training us, He keeps shaping us, and our performance becomes more and more consistent with our desires. As, we, as he keeps giving us those desires. So, it, so we renounce. And what we renounce, first of all, there's two things that it says here. Impiety or irreligion. And, and what all that is is false ideas about God. You know, things that come from either ourselves or from other human beings. Well, God wants you to, God is, his desire is, God, God is, we say no to those kind of ideas. You know, God is not generic. God is very specific. And as we saw last week, he reveals himself to us, first of all, through Christ. He reveals himself to us through scripture. He reveals himself through his presence in our lives. 
it's not something that's that that's that's general that anybody can just come up with. It's specific. God is about these things. He's not about these things. And so we renounce all these other things and we embrace these truths about God, who God is. We renounce it. Many people live in a fantasy kind of relationship with God where everything is bubbly and wonderful and God is just, you know, all of these kinds of things. Our relationship with God is always based upon what he reveals to us about himself in his word. It's There's reality. It's the reality of God's presence living in our lives. Whatever other source is giving bad ideas or bad information about God, that's what we renounce. We say no to that, not that direction, but we're going to move in the direction of knowing who God is based upon his word, based upon his revelation of himself to us in Christ, based upon his presence in our lives, based upon the work of the Holy Spirit in us. That's what we're going to say yes to. So the, God's grace trains us to renounce bad ideas about God and also renounces us to, it also trains us to renounce self-centered passions. That's what this uh, uh, word means here, worldly passions. It's meaning about to have as the center of my life, my desires, to have as the center of my life, my will, to have as the center of my life, me, that, that says I'm going to do what I want to do. It teaches us to renounce that. That's not the direction in which God's grace leads us uh, in which to move. God, God's grace in our lives leads us to move in the direction of Jesus being the center of my life. And so that all the as other aspects of my life, my, my marriage, my family, my, my career, my, my, my ministry, the, my involvement with brothers and sisters in Christ, how I live in this world as, as a neighbor, uh, as a member, someone who lives in Southern California, the United States and the world, all of those things are going to find their direction from the center. It's Jesus that integrates everything about my life. He gives direction to everything, not just my religious part of my life, but everything. I'm going to renounce me or anything else as the center of my life. So many times today, people are more identified by their politic than they are identified by Jesus Christ. They're more identified by their ideology than they are by Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about Christians you know, that we're conservative Christians or we're liberal Christians or, or we're this or we're that. No, we're followers of Jesus, period. That's what identifies us. And that's what's at the center of my life. And, and too many times, that's not what is informing the other things that we give ourselves to. And so it becomes very, very important that we say no to anything else being that which determines how I'm going to live or that's going to determine my take on anything else. It's not a political, it's not a social, it's not an economic reason why I'm doing things. It's because of Jesus. It's because of his direction in my life. And now that makes life more difficult. It doesn't make life less difficult, but it makes it more difficult, but it makes it better because there's that sense of peace. There's that sense of joy that comes knowing that you're right where God wants you to be. You're right in the place where he wants you to be. So we learn to say no to anything that isn't. Bad ideas about God and anything else at the center of my life. But that's not all that grace does. As grace encounters us, the text says that uh, as it goes on, it says this. Uh, it, it says, and in this and in the present age, in this moment, now, in, in the now of our life, you know, whether you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 60s, your 80s, whatever you happen to be, this is the now. This is the moment of your life. In the moment where you find yourself, grace is still training you. Grace is training you to live in a certain kind of way. And notice the words that are, that are used here. It trains us to live this way. Here's the direction in which we're being trained to live. The words are self-controlled, upright, and godly. Now, let me break those down so we understand. The word, if you remember King James, the, the word that is translated here is sober. Now, in our world, 
Sober means we're not drunk, right? So we, we, it, this, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about alcohol here. Um, what, what it's talking about is responsibility. It, it teaches us to, to, to live responsible or self-controlled, or, or maybe even a better word is focused. We're focused and we live in such a way that we're focused on the things that Jesus is leading us to be and to do. So here are some of the, the marks of how you know if you're focused or if you're responsible. One, that you're going to think through the consequences of your actions before you take them. In other words, you, you don't just do something and then think about the consequences later. You think about the consequences before you do it. That's responsible. So that whether you're talking about financial issues or you're talking about relational issues, you're talking about who you're going to marry, you're talking about you know, uh, if you're going to buy a house or not, if you're going to talk about your career, if you're going to talk about moving to Istanbul, if you're going to, you know, what, whatever it might be, you're thinking about the consequences that come as a result of that. Uh, I've spent many times struggling with uh, missionaries who are trying to decide when God has called them like to Thailand or someplace. The, the consequence of that decision is they're going to live 8,000 miles away from their family. They're going to raise their children without grandparents. They're going to all of those kinds of issues. Now, are you ready for that? Are you ready for what that means? See, too many missionaries, they go on the field for the first, for the first thing, and they realize it's just too hard. I, I, don't, I, I don't like being away from you know, my culture. I don't like being away from my family, and, and, and it's a one-term mission. The time to think through those kinds of decisions is before you go. That's responsible. The grace of God that is in our lives as a result of God's presence in our lives teaches us to be responsible. It teaches us to think through the consequences before I act. That for every action, there's a reaction. There's cause and effect. And to think that through before we act. So one of the things that believers are, people who are being trained by the grace of God, are people who are responsible. You know, they're not people who turn around and blame others for what happened in their lives. They're not people who are always looking for an excuse or a reason why things didn't work out. Because before they ever did something, they thought about it. They, they thought through the consequences. Responsibility means that, secondly, that we don't just follow the crowd. You know, the e easiest thing in the world is to follow convention what everyone else is doing, what everyone else is wearing, how everyone else is... You know, a lot of this, uh, uh, these riots and things were fun to join in. I mean, it's just like, let's jump on. This is fun. Without thinking through all of the, the consequences, we join the crowd. So much of our spending, so much of the way that we live our life, what we watch on TV, etc., is in compliance with what everyone else is doing. We do it because it's popular. We do it because it's, it's what everyone else is doing. Well, the grace of God teaches us to do things not because someone else is doing it, but because it's what honors the Lord. It's what the Lord has put in my heart to do. It's because this is what I want to do, not because what someone else wants to do. Or it teaches us not just to consume, not just to buy things, but to be responsible, to be thoughtful about things. Like uh, those kind of issues that ask these kinds of questions. I used to hate it when my parents said this. Wait, well, do you really need that? I remember my junior year, I really wanted a new set of golf clubs. And uh, now I was playing really well. And I had a great set of golf clubs that my, that my dad had gotten me. But a new kind of golf club came out, a Wilson X31. And boy, I, I really wanted those. And and I, I can remember my dad saying, and, and I'd worked all summer and I had the money for it, but the choice was I could buy new school clothes or I could buy golf clubs. You know, I could buy a new gun that, to hunt with, et cetera, or I could buy golf clubs. And my dad would say, well, Wade, do you really need these clubs? And this is my dad who is a terrific golfer and he's playing like 1955 Ben Hogan clubs. This is in 1965. He's playing 10-year-old clubs. I've got two-year-old clubs, and I want new ones. And he says, do you really need them? See, the, the grace of God teaches us to work on the basis of, of asking those kinds of questions about what I need. Don't just consume, but, but rather, as it says, be thoughtful about it. And then when things don't work out 
really well. Don't blame or excuse, but face your responsibility. Be able to say, you know what? I did that. I screwed up. My, 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 my fault. Th that's what the grace of God teaches us, trains us, shapes us, molds us uh, to be people who assume their own responsibility for their, their actions. Now, the second word that it says it trains us, it trains us to be responsible or self-controlled, but it, it also trains us, as it says here, uh, to be righteous. Now, the word righteous has to do with how we relate to others. Righteousness is always that which is people in relationship with others, how we treat each other. In fact, this passage finds itself in the middle of a section in, in which Paul's been talking about how husbands and wives relate to each other, how slaves and owners and, uh, you know, all of those, how we relate to each other. And then it's this because, and we do it that way because the grace of God is training us. And so righteous has to do with all of those kinds of, of relationships. And so righteous, how, how we work towards others. And there's two big ideas in the Bible about the idea of, of righteous relationships. And the first one is how Jesus dealt with people. He always dealt with people with compassion. And, and compassion is trying to understand where they are and why they're there. W without passing judgment, without being critical, without making an objective uh, evaluation. It's trying to understand where they are and who they are. Compassion. You look at, at how Jesus related to, to all kinds of people. In fact, he was always criticized because he was relating to people who the religious community at the time had said, these are unclean, unwashed, unwanted people, women, uh, uh, people who are sick, uh, foreigners, etc. Th those were always excluded and Jesus related to them with compassion. And then the second word is, is the word justice. Uh, righteous has to do with justice. It's, it's the, the passage in Micah chapter 6, 8, where the, the prophet says this, God has told you, O mortal human beings, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. That becomes the standard. God is, is forming and shaping us by his grace in our lives to, to, to live in such a way that justice is what comes out. Of us. Our, our concern is what's, is what's right. And so if you are going to live in a way that justice permeates your relationships, then you also have to live in a way where you are against every form of injustice. Not just the kind that you can connect with, but injustice that maybe you don't have any experience of, but is impacting other people. There's a sense of injustice. And so what what is God shaping us to be? He's shaping us to be people who say no to bad ideas about God, People who say no to their own desires, but put God at the center, Jesus at the center of their life, it, it, being trained in, in this present world right now to, to live in, in such a way that uh, we are responsible, that we are righteous, and that um, uh, we are, thirdly, that we have piety. And that's the, what the word godly means, piety. Now, that's not a word we use a whole lot in our world, piety. But it really means that, this. So piety is the, originally the description of a person in whose life you recognized God. This was a pious person. In other words, when you looked at this person, you could see the attributes of God. You could see the character of God. We talk about Christ-likeness. That's what godly is, so that God is recognized in me. Another way of putting it is this, so that a godly person, I'm being trained to be a person so that I'm, my life is consistent with who I say I am. I, I say that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. My desire is to live in such a way as to be pleasing to him. Well, is my life consistent with my confession, with what I said? And also consistent with whose I am. I belong to God. By virtue of Christ's death on the cross and my receiving him into my life, I've been bought with a price. I, I'm his. I belong to him. I'm part of God's 
family. We are his possession. So is my life consistent with being the possession of God? Is, is my life consistent with my confession of who I say that I am? That's godly. And the other idea that you find in, in piety is so in response to how God has worked in your life, your life is now lived in terms of gratitude. There's a tremendous sense of gratitude. Not wanting more, but being satisfied. It's very close to what Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I, I find myself. That, 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 that sense of, of gratitude. And part of gratitude is learning how to accept what grace offers. The, the sense of bringing salvation to all. I've received it. Grace has brought me salvation. Now receive and act on what you have received. And when you think about salvation, what we receive is forgiveness. Well, if you've been forgiven, then live like a forgiven person. Don't keep living in the past. Don't keep living with your failures. You know, you've been forgiven. You, you've been accepted. Don't live your life trying to gain acceptance. You've already been accepted. Live as an accepted person. And as we've said so many times before, people will either accept you or they won't. But there's nothing you can do that's going to make them accept you. Last week we talked about, have you ever discovered there's people that don't like you? Yes, but live as if they do. Live in an, as an accepted person. Live as a person with value. God has given you gifts. God has given you abilities. He's given you things that you can use for him so that his life can be seen even more clearly through you as you serve him using your abilities, your skills, your gifts. And part of the salvation package is that you are loved. You don't have to go seek for love because you are loved. You know, when David was reflecting upon all that God had given to him, he asked this question in Psalm 116, what shall I give to the Lord? What shall I return to the Lord for all his blessings to me, for everything that he has done for me? He says, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Two things that means. I will take what God has given me. I will live it out to the full of what he has given me. And I will worship and I will praise him. I will call on the name of the Lord. That's a word for worship. Gratitude. Gr people with gratitude worship like crazy. Because they know to whom it is that they are grateful. They, they know that uh, apart from Jesus, we have nothing. And so we come with a heart full of gratitude and we call on his name, offering ourselves to him in worship. And so what, what uh, Paul is saying here to Titus, he says, remind the people that as they're waiting for the second coming of Christ, for the second great appearing, the manifestation of God's grace, where everything is worked out, where eternal life becomes reality, not something that we're just anticipating, but we're experiencing. As you're waiting for that, live this way. The grace of God is training you to live this way while you're waiting for everything to be completed. Here's your response to God's grace. So let's just think for a few minutes at the, the end of uh, this time together the, uh, of, of our response. Just the first thought is this, you know, grace is not a get out of a jail free card. Uh, grace is not fire insurance so that it doesn't matter what we do or how we live, we're, we're covered. That, that's not what grace is. In fact, in Romans chapter eight when, or six, when that chapter was, question was asked, uh, if, if grace is, is so much grace abounds, then we can live anywhere we want. Paul says, God forbid. There's no way work. Grace is what saves us, but then grace is also what trains us to live in a certain way. Grace is not a get out of jail free card. Grace is not fire insurance policy, so that it doesn't matter what we do or what we become, but rather grace is the presence of Jesus living inside of us. Boy, we talk here at Village Church a lot about God's presence, don't we? The, the sense of, of coming into his presence. The, the sense of God's presence being with us. That's the big idea in the, in the incarnation. That God is here with us. That God is part of us. That we're in a relationship with God. We can call on his name anytime. As we pray, we're confident he hears and he answers our prayers because he's with us. 
He, he, he's right here. So grace is the presence of Jesus living in us, shaping and molding us into the people that God intends us to be. Grace keeps on working after we've been saved. We're saved by grace through faith. But grace keeps on working so that we live the Christian life out as well, molding us into the people that God intends us to be. It trains us to move in that direction, to move in the direction of becoming the people that God wants us to be. And, and remember, whenever you're thinking about direction, when you're saying yes to this direction, you're saying no to that direction. So we're saying yes to this direction. So our message concludes with just one question. So is grace training you? Is grace right now in the now of your life, in the moment of your life that you find yourself living in, whether you're in your 80s or you're in your 60s or in your 40s or 20s or you're a high school student, is grace training you as a believer to be the person that God wants you to be, to work in your desires in such a way that you say no to this and yes to this, to work in such a way that you live responsibly and righteously and godly in this present age. Is that what God's grace is doing in your life? Titus says that's the point of God's grace, to work in your life, to produce all of that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, there, there's no question that our desire this morning is to allow you to work in our lives in such a way that we become pleasing to you. May we hear these words and allow you to train us step by step moment by moment, into the people that you want us to be right now in this moment as we wait for the second coming of Christ when all of this life is over and we live in your presence forevermore. Lord, thank you that Paul reminded us this morning that grace continues to work to develop us into the people that are pleasing to you. Thank you for this time that we've had this morning together. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close with a song. Would you stand to your feet and look at your lyric sheets or online and, and let's sing this song together. Four points, four, we go. And one, two. so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace
is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing. Thank you so much for being here today. If you can stay and help us clean up a little bit, we appreciate it. Otherwise, have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday.